The following audio presentation is a production of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, in association with the Division of Continuing Studies and the Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience. This production was originally funded by the New Jersey Historical Commission and has been remastered by the Rutgers ITV Studio. That's Fats Waller, Harlem's harmful little armful, playing of all things a church organ in of all places Camden, New Jersey. But it's really not surprising. In the early years of this century, Victor Talking Machine Company and its successor, RCA, made Camden the center of the recording and entertainment world. The story of this legacy begins in the mid-1890s in Eldridge Johnson's tiny Camden machine shop. A customer brought Johnson a primitive talking machine, sounding, he later said, like a parrot with a sore throat. Johnson developed a spring motor which allowed the talking machine to run without constant cranking. From this start, Johnson founded Victor Talking Machine Company and built an empire. Nipper the Dog and the company's His Master's Voice logo became familiar around the world, and Victor Victrolas became fixtures in millions of homes. Fred Barnum is author of His Master's Voice in America, a history of Victor and RCA. The thing that Johnson is credited in, in doing more than anything else was turning it into a, an entertainment uh, device for home use. He uh, came up with the idea of getting a hold of uh, famous recording artists, mainly in the opera field. World-renowned Italian tenor Enrico Caruso probably was the most significant of the early Victor artists. His recordings early in the century invested an infant industry with credibility. Others followed Caruso, artists like Heifetz, John McCormack, and Leopold Stokowski, who conducted the Philadelphia Orchestra in this Camden recording of the work of J.S. Bach. But Victor wasn't limited to the classics. Fats Waller, recording in Camden in 1927, was just one of the early jazz greats, dance bands, and popular singers of every stripe in Victor's stable. Many Victor artists recorded in the days before microphones, which weren't introduced until the mid-1920s. Then, musicians grouped around long horns or megaphones with the loudest position in the rear. The sound was recorded on a disc of hot beeswax spinning on a turntable powered by drop weights. Leslie Rogers worked for the Boston Symphony Orchestra under Dr. Carl Mook in 1917. In this commemorative recording, Rogers describes an early Camden recording session. We were just finishing Tchaikovsky's fourth when all of a sudden every factory whistle in Camden went off, put off for lunch. When we listened to the playback later, it was the wonder of the musical world. Those lunch whistles blew for thousands working in an ever-expanding giant. By the time RCA bought Victor in 1929, nearly 10,000 employees worked in buildings sprawled over 50 acres of Camden's waterfront. RCA transformed the Camden complex into the world's largest radio manufacturing facility. At the same time, RCA engineers working in Camden under Vladimir Zworkin began secretly developing a revolutionary new technology, radio with pictures. Fred Barnum details the achievements of Zworkin, now known as the father of television. And they actually had the first working models of television cameras, which were known as iconoscopes by Zworkin, that was his coin term, and television receivers, which were known as kinescopes. Working models here at Camden as early as 1934-35. Lauren Jones, now in his 90s, worked with Zworkin in Camden. In the early 1930s, Jones supervised the installation of the television broadcasting antenna high atop the Empire State Building. There, he became a member of an exclusive club. Those of us who were foolish enough would climb up the antenna, reach around with one arm while holding on with the other arm, and touch the nut on the top of the weather vane. That was the highest piece of physical material ever erected by man anywhere. I'm very proud of being a member of the Nut Club. By 1939, RCA was ready to begin regular television broadcasts, and RCA President David Sarnoff introduced the new system at the New York World's Fair. It is with a feeling of humbleness 
that I come to this moment of announcing the birth in this country of a new art so important in its implications that it is bound to affect all society. It is an art which shines like a torch of hope in a troubled world. World War II delayed the commercial development of television, and Zworkin and Jones moved to the new RCA Research Laboratory in Princeton. But RCA and Camden continued developing and producing industry-standard broadcast equipment until the 1980s, when the corporation was bought by General Electric. Today, most of the old RCA Victor buildings left in Camden are vacant hulks awaiting demolition. But officials vow one building will be spared, the sprawling old cabinet factory which features the landmark Nipper Tower, graced at the top with round stained glass windows depicting Nipper listening to his master's voice on a talking machine. Thomas Corcoran is president of the Coopers Ferry Development Association. We are absolutely determined to preserve this building. Camden has lost too much, too many other buildings of historic value. And this is probably the, the most important architectural uh, building left in term, that symbolizes Camden's industrial history and what the city once was. With this vision lies the hope that Camden's historic past, the legacy of Zworkin and Jones and Eldridge Johnson, who brought the stars to Camden, will not be lost. I'm Paul Conlow for New Jersey Times.